Good evening. My name is Ian Wardrop. I'm director of the Frick Collection. I'm delighted to welcome you all tonight. Um, this is the first lecture complementing our just opened exhibition, Antico, the Golden Age of Renaissance Bronze. The show is on view until July 29th and will be open tonight for about a half an hour after the lecture for those of you who want to take another look. There are several other lectures and programs on this subject. I urge you to consult uh, our schedule in printed form or uh, our website for the times of these lectures. Tonight's lecture is being streamed live on our website and will be archived so that you can tell friends and colleagues who couldn't attend tonight that they can actually see Claudia, um, even in Vienna if they choose. We have decided to continue to stream some 24 lectures next year in the 2012-2013 um, season because it's been very well received. I would also like to welcome a large group of friends of the Kunsthistorisches Museum who are here tonight, including the director, Sabine Haag. We all look forward to the reopening of the Kunstkammer there in 2013. Um, and um, it's a great occasion for all of us who love sculpture and works of art and we'll all look forward to seeing it in Vienna soon. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's lecturer, Claudia Krise Gersch, curator of Renaissance sculpture at the Kunstkammer at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Claudia was a contributor to the Antico exhibition with Denise Allen of the Frick and Eleonora Luciano of the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, I first met Claudia in the late 1980s in Chicago where I was a curator and had recently had the pleasure of installing a show called Renaissance Master Bronzes from the collection of the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Among these were masterpieces by the North Italian sculptor nicknamed Antico, such as his Venus Felix or Hercules and Antaeus, which are now back in this country uh, in the show in the Frick. Not long after that exhibition in Chicago closed, I was visited by a young art historian, Claudia, who was on a kind of wanderjahr studying sculpture in American museums. I was immediately impressed by the depth of her knowledge and passion for sculpture, and I'm happy to say that we've remained friends and colleagues ever since. Claudia went on to have a distinguished career, taking her PhD in 1996 from the University of Vienna. Luckily for us in America, she's also spent a great deal of time studying in and contributing to the knowledge of our museums. She was a Crest Fellow at the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, a Mellon Fellow at the European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, my former um, place, a Research Fellow at the National Gallery of Washington and at the Center for Advanced Studies of Visual Arts in Washington. Since 2003, she's been in charge of Renaissance sculpture at the Kunsthistorisches Museum, which is a critical position in that field. This is one of the greatest collections of its kind in the world, important not only for the bronze's quality, but also for their documented history and exceptional state of preservation. Over the years, the curators of this collection, from Leo Planischig to Manfred Leiter Jasper to Claudia Krise Gersch, have also been some of the most learned and productive scholars, particularly in North Italian sculpture. And Claudia has published numerous articles uh, and catalog entries on such sculptors as Niccolo Roccatagliata, Tiziano Aspetti, Alessandro Vittoria, Riccio, the subject of uh, a recent exhibition here at the Frick, to which she also contributed, Antico, and others. She has also organized exhibitions, such as on the great Florentine sculptor John Bologna at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in 2006. Generously sharing her insights with colleagues, she is a sought-after speaker and participant in symposia. We're delighted that she could join us tonight to talk about Antico. The Kunsthistorisches Museum is, has the largest group uh, of works by that artist in the world and has lent no less than seven works to this exhibit, for which we are very grateful. Please welcome Claudia Krise Gersch, whose topic tonight is Antico, a pioneer of Renaissance sculpture. Good evening, and thank you, Ian, very, very much for this lovely introduction. Um, if I start to express my feelings now, I'm worried that I will cry, so I probably better start uh, only with, um, start go right into the lecture, and I uh, just want to say I'm incredibly happy to be back here. 
Um, I have the great pleasure to speak tonight about one of my favorite subjects, about a sculptor known under the pseudonym Antico. Although that he is known by this name may be a bit of an exaggeration, for he is not known that well at all. When you type the word Antico into a search engine, such as Google or Dogpile, you will get surprising results. The last time I checked, uh, I got a pizzeria in Atlanta, an Italian restaurant in Chicago, and the producer of bathroom tiles in Florida. <laughs> well, and you see this, at least in my view, has to change. And I'm sure that it will change um, because of the beautiful exhibition that opened yesterday here at the Frick Collection. It is a great honor, indeed, to be the first speaker in a series of lectures that will be presented over the next month about Antico, the star of this exhibition. I'm not sure how many of you had already the opportunity to see the exhibition. It is a truly exquisite display that seems to carry you back in time to the early 16th century and into the ducal palace of Mantua, far away from the hectic life of the Big Apple. When you look at Antico's masterful bronzes, reliefs, medals, and busts, you will get immersed into an ideal vision of the world of antiquity as it could have been created only in the Italian Renaissance. Antico's works exude a rare serenity. They depict a world that seems to be totally free of terror, pain, and any kind of conflict. And that is a strange experience one has to get used to. I suppose that for many of you, even for those who have already developed an interest in Italian Renaissance bronzes, and how could you not have developed such an interest after the marvelous show on Andrea Riccio presented here two and a half years ago? Well, nevertheless, I suppose that for many of you, the exhibition on Antico will prove to be a discovery. The discovery of an artist who is still not as well known as he deserves and not taken as seriously as he should be. Antico was born and died in the territory of Mantua, a minor marquisate in Upper Italy, squeezed in between the far larger duchy of Milan and the Venetian Republic on the trade route that then linked Italy with Germany. The ruling family in Mantua, I see here I just wanted to point out this um, you find it in Upper Italy, Mantua. The ruling family in Mantua were the Gonzaga. I show you here a rather reduced family tree, focusing on those family members that had something to do with Antico. And those were two of the younger sons of Margrave Ludovico, namely Gian Francesco, the founder of the line of Bozzolo and Sabionetta, who was together with his cultivated wife, Antonio del Balzo, Antico's first patron. After Gian Francesco's death, Antico worked for Ludovico Gonzaga, the Bishop of Mantua. The relationship with Isabella d'Este, the famous collector and patron of the arts, was always an informal one and started only around the turn of the century. It became more intense after the death of Andrea Mantegna in 1506 and finally during her widowhood that is, after the death of her husband, Francesco Gonzaga, in 1519. With Andrea Mantegna, I dropped the name of the artist who is probably the main cause for Mantua's fame until today. I show you here the famous fresco by Mantegna in what is today called the Ducal Palace. In the 15th century, the Gonzaga was still Marchesi. Uh, on the screen, you see the court scene on the west wall of the so-called Camera degli Sposi, showing Ludovico Gonzaga with his German wife, Barbara of Brandenburg. That's her. Um, which is um, surrounded by his children and courtiers, including his dog, Rubino. The Gonzaga were very clever and succeeded through marital alliances and skillful diplomacy to keep their dominion politically stable and to establish an illustrious court. Indeed, Mantua 
became in the 15th century a major cultural center whose fame was in no relation to the actual size of the territory. So Mantegna was working at the Gonzaga court, but he was not the only avant-garde artist employed there. Leon Battista Alberti built in Mantova such masterpieces of Renaissance architecture as the Church of San Andrea. It is important to keep these facts in mind, for Mantua may have been a small town, but in terms of culture and art, it was in no way provincial backwater. On the contrary, the 1460s and 1470s were exciting years in Mantua, and into this stimulating climate, Antico was born. Of course, he was not born as Antico but as Pier Jacopo Alari. We do not know when he was born, but we suppose that it was more or less around 1455. And Dico died, and that we know for sure, in 1528. We also know that he was the son of a butcher, which does not make for a very promising start. You see, sons in that time usually followed their fathers in what was considered to be the family's business. So if you were not born into an artisan's family, you had to give very clear signs of a special talent early on in order to be given, when you were lucky, a proper education. Unfortunately, we know absolutely nothing about Antico's training. For obvious reasons, however, we assume that he was apprenticed to a goldsmith. In 1516, Pier Jacopo Alari was allowed to add to his name the noble title of De Bonacolsi, which indicates not only that he was held in high esteem, but also the social position he had achieved. Nevertheless, the artist was known by his nickname, Antico. It is difficult to decide whether this nickname was earned because he made sculpture that was inspired by antiquity, or if it was a name that he had chosen himself in order to announce his artistic vision. I tend to believe that the name Antico was a statement and that Antico declared with his name what kind of artist he wanted to be. But no matter how and why this nickname was invented, it is utterly fitting, for there is no other sculptor of the Renaissance who embodies the very idea of this period, which was simply spoken to revive the art of antiquity better than Pier Jacopo Alari. For his oeuvre represents indeed the most faithful, accurate, and uncompromising recreation of antique sculpture of the entire epoch. Antico apparently identified himself totally with his pseudonym. He signed all his letters with this name, and also the few times he signed his works, he did so only as Antico. I show you here one of the many letters by him where you can see his signature, Antico Servo. There are actually over 100 documents preserved which relate in one way or the other to Antico, and that is quite extraordinary. These documents tell us that he must have been a very nice chap, that he had apparently an endearing character, loved his wife, who made great soap, and other such terribly useful things. But unfortunately, they tell us very little about the artist and his work. And this is extremely frustrating. This letter is actually one of the more interesting ones. It is a response by Antico to Isabella d'Este, who wanted to buy from Mantegna an antique, sculptor, an, an antique sculpture from the painter's own collection, a head of Faustina. And so Isabella wanted to know from Antico if the price of 100 ducats, uh, which Mantegna was asking, seemed like a fair price to him. Funnily, she also assured Antico that she would not tell a word to Mantegna if he would say something bad about the Faustina bust. So, and here is Antico's answer. Illustrissima madama, 
Ah, so, dear most illustrious lady, quando la testa di Mise Andrea non fuse consumata dal tempo in molti loci, so if the head by, uh, owned by Mr. Andrea, Mantegna, would not be destroyed in a couple of places, la precera ancora più di centro truncato. So if it were not so ruined by time, I would even say that it is worth more than a hundred ducats. It's a wonderfully diplomatic answer and shows that Antico was a perfect, really consummate a courtier. It demonstrates, of course, also uh, that Antico's was a great expert when it came to antique sculpture and that his expertise was highly valued. But how did he acquire that? How was it possible that the son of a butcher would raise to the position of court artist and advisor of Isabella d'Este? Because in the 15th century, social advancement became possible for artists, above all for artists learned in the culture of classical antiquity. How Antico acquired that knowledge, we do not know exactly. But it is certain that he went to Rome and that he restored antiquities. And that was perhaps the best training he could get. Perhaps he went to Rome with the Mantuan medalist Cristoforo di Geremia, who may have been his teacher. Cristoforo di Geremia restored in the late 1460s the antique equestrian monument of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. And this commission would have brought the young Antico just into the right circles. Although there are some very enticing indications, uh, in the end, we can only speculate about Antico's early years in Rome. We know for sure, however, that Antico restored one group of the famous horse tamers, fourth century Roman copies of Greek originals, which stood and still do so on the Quirinal Hill in Rome. As you can see on this historic print, they were rather badly damaged and Antico restored the right group. Oops, go back here. So this group. Antico restored this group and left an inscription. It's, hard, it's impossible to see, one has to know where it is. It was only discovered in 1981. And here he announces proudly, Anticos Mantovanos Rifezit. So, Antico of Mantua recreated it, redid it, so he brought it back to life. Otherwise, Antico's beginnings are a mystery. He comes into view for the first time only in 1479 with a medal for Gianfrancesco Gonzaga. Over the next years, he made a couple of beautiful medals, as you can see in the exhibition. And I show you here just one example which is quite impressive in the way it imitates ancient models, that is, antique coins, of course. You can also see that this medal bears one of his rare signatures, anti, short for antico, here. Antico did hear something that was done so far only very rarely in medals. He depicted Gianfrancesco, his patron, not in contemporary dress, but in a drapery a l'antica. In fact, it is only the hairstyle that reveals that Gianfrancesco is not an ancient Roman. Antico demonstrates with this medal that he was not satisfied with simply working in a classicizing style, but that his aspiration was to create objects that should be virtually indistinguishable from authentic antique works of art. And for this artistic vision, medals were apparently not the right medium. So Antico started to produce small bronzes with a technical perfection that was an absolute novelty. As I said before, we do have tons of documents about Antico, but they tell us very little, particularly when it comes to questions of chronology. We are pretty much left in the dark. One very valuable source, however, is the inventory of the possessions of Gianfrancesco Gonzaga, Antico's first patron, who died in 1496. In his inventory, a couple of bronze statuettes by Antico can be identified, and so we can be fairly certain that the following models by Antico were made by that year at the latest. The Spinario, 
which is, of course, a copy after the famous antique bronze sculpture of a boy withdrawing a thorn from the sole of his foot in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. In the same museum, you find also the model for this statuette, the monumental equestrian monument, uh, the monumental equestrian statue of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, which I have shown to you before, the Meliega, which was made after an antique sculpture that perished in a fire in the 18th century. And I show you here an old engraving of it. Then the marvelous little Cupid from the Bargello, who is, of course, inspired by antique models, but does not copy a specific sculpture, but combines different models in a very innovative way. And the Hercules with a club, a piece you know well, since you have a beautiful cast of it here at the Frick Collection. The Hercules is a particularly fascinating uh, case since it does not copy a monumental antique sculpture, but was modeled apparently after an antique small bronze statuette. This is quite an exciting case and one of the discoveries of this exhibition, about which I'm sure you will, he will hear more uh, in one of the next lectures. For the moment, I just want to focus on the fact that the bronzes I showed to you so far in this very quick run-through were created by Antico before 1496. One word of caution, however. Since Antico was able to make multiple casts of his models and would reuse the molds for his statuettes also after the passing of a couple of years, it is not possible to tell with absolute certainty which of the existing versions of one model, and in some cases, like in the Hercules, we have four of them, was actually the one owned by Gianfrancesco and thus the earliest known cast of it. As you can imagine, these are issues which are hotly debated amongst us crazy art historians, but I will not bother you with that tonight. I would like to make another point. Here are again the bronzes I just showed to you separately in an overview. We can be fairly sure that these five bronzes by Antico were invented before 1496, that is, before the turn of the century. So these, ladies and gentlemen, and this is truly important, these are creations of the 15th century, not of the 16th century, of the 15th century. Do you have any idea how revolutionary they are. It is difficult for us today to truly appreciate the innovation in Antico's art because we have seen too much of the same type of sculptures. Take, for instance, the Apollo of the Belvedere, modeled, of course, after the antique statue which is displayed today in the Vatican Museums. The antique statue was unearthed in a Roman vineyard in 1489. And it is possible that Antico made his small-scale copy of it as early as 1490. You have to realize what this means. This means that Antico was the first artist to copy this statue. All the many copies of the Apollo of the Belvedere you and I know were made afterwards. Because the Apollo Belvedere became such a famous antique, there have been made countless copies of it. And this is why we have difficulties to understand how extraordinary exciting Antico statuette is. But there is more. The antique statue of the Apollo was miraculously well preserved, but the hands were missing. Antico, in his statuette, added the missing hands in a pose that he thought right. He omitted the tree trunk, which is needed only in marble sculpture, as well as the support under Apollo's right foot. You see. Yeah. Finally, he added gilding to the statuette and silver eyes, for he apparently knew from classical texts such as Pliny that this was the way the Greek originals once looked like. So he tried to improve the antique original and to create a work of art that would capture the original splendor of a Greek bronze sculpture. Antico's statuettes are of an amazing quality. Yet he was able to make more than one cast of his models 
was an absolute novelty. So far, bronze was cast by the so-called direct method, which means that the artist models a figure in wax and takes a mold of it. In this process, however, the original figure is inevitably lost and one can make only one cast. That's it. So if that fails, you have to start from scratch again. And Tico used instead the, complex, the very complex method of casting indirectly. And when you, when you want to know how this is done, I urge you to visit the marvelously done website on Antico created by the National Gallery of Art in Washington, where the exhibition on Antico was shown before it came to New York. There you can learn everything about how indirect casting is done. I only want to emphasize that Antico was the first sculptor to use this technique, the indirect cast, with such a degree of perfection. The technique employed by Antico remained practically the same from then on and was used from Giambologna to Soldani. The very idea of being able to produce more than one excellent version of a model is after all the reason that made small bronzes so successful as affordable objects for collectors. But Antico's bronzes are not only cleverly cast, they are also beautifully cast. Thanks to indirect casting, his bronzes are hollow and light, with an even thickness of the walls. So it is a pleasure to hold them in your hand. The execution is superb. The finish of the surfaces, the dark patination, the lush fire gilding, the delicate silvering of the eyes, are of a perfection not seen since antiquity. And yet, also the incredible surface of Antico's bronzes is something we take for granted. That is because we are used to objects like this. I show you here a randomly picked French mantel clock with the statuette of Orpheus from circa 1810. Objects like these prevent us from recognizing the extraordinary originality of Antico's creations. In order to understand Antico, we have to banish from our mind more than 500 years of sculpture and decorative arts. And we have to remember what actually existed in terms of comparable sculpture before Antico started to make his bronzes, and that was not much. Bronze statuettes actually dating from the Quattrocento are exceedingly rare. But before we can look into that matter, we have to define what a small bronze actually is. It is the revival of a genre that had existed already, of course, in antiquity. First examples can be found as early as 700 BC, mostly rather crude votive figures. The genre became a popular form of art in the Hellenistic era as decoration for the private house. And in the Roman world, small bronze figurines were beloved as protective household gods and idols. Hundreds of examples are known, and I show you here just one randomly picked example in order to give you an idea. It is a Greco-Roman statuette from the first century BC, about 11 inches tall, that once formed part of a Roman household shrine. Well, objects like these were known in the Renaissance and collected. One admired them because they were actual artifacts from the revered ancients, something to touch objects that made antiquity known to many only from the texts of classical authors like Pliny suddenly alive and tangible. And so they were collected and one started to imitate them. Philaretes' rendering of the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, we have seen the antique original already briefly, is the earliest experiment in this rediscovered genre of the small bronze statuette. It is the first genuine Renaissance bronze statuette in the sense that it is an independent work of art without any function and made for private delectation. Philaretes clumsy but exciting bronze is, so to speak, the first test drive in the new genre. 
There is, of course, no doubt that Antico created with his version the far superior reduction of the antique monument. It is enough uh, just to compare the elegance of the horses. which is an entirely different rendering uh, in Philavetes case. Let's compare the elegance of the legs in Antico's cast and see what Philavetes was doing. Here, another comparison, just to give you an idea of the quality of Antico's work. However, the price for the first small bronze inspired by antique models in subject matter and genre has to be awarded to Filarete. But it will remain for a long while the only exercise in the new field. The next examples were made only at around 1470, 80. Like the little David, here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, made by Bartolomeo Bellano, a pupil of Donatello, which is a marvelous composition, clearly inspired by his master's rendering of the same subject. David is a figure of, uh, the, uh, of the Bible, uh, but it is not such a sacred religious figure like a proper saint. But still, it seems a bit out of place to look at this statuette as an object just for delectation. The element of blatant, unabashed pleasure is thus missing, and this is a very vital feeling when it comes to the proper enjoyment of small bronzes. The same is true for Bellano's other bronze statuette, a lovely rendering of Saint Jerome in the Louvre. Besides the problem of subject matter, it's, a, it's not a pagan motif, it's a religious motif from Christianity, you can see that Bellano's bronzes have nothing to do with the sophistication of Antico's first creations, which are pretty much made contemporaneously. Also, the great Polaiolo seems to have taken to the new genre. The only table piece with an absolute claim to his authorship is the Hercules and Antaeus in the Bagello. And here we are coming already closer to the idea of the small bronze. Polaiolo's statuette is a great piece, wonderfully expressive, but essentially a unique, non-recurring experiment. Above all, it cannot be compared to the refinement of Antico's work, as are the creations of the Florentine artist Bertoldo di Giovanni, a key figure in the history of the early Renaissance, disciple of Donatello and mentor of Michelangelo, and certainly a pioneer in the creation of small bronze statuettes. I show you here Bertoldo's Bellerophon in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, which is almost a solid cast, immensely heavy, and thus not exactly a table piece that you can hold in your hand and turn around. When you do turn it around, you will find out that the bronze has actually only one viewpoint from which the composition works properly. When seen from the front, it looks like this. Bertoldo has used rather ingeniously the body of Bellerophon as support for the jumping horse. The body of the hero is in fact totally sunken into that of the wild animal. In this view, you may glimpse perhaps also the roughness of the cast. Certain parts like the wings of Pegasus are actually more carved than cast which means that the details were chiseled in only after the casting. However, despite the experimental character of Bertoldo's bronze, it does give a very promising foretaste of the potential of the genre. The Bellerophon is a well-known piece for bronze aficionados because it has a remarkable signature on its underside. And signatures are extremely rare with small bronzes. Thanks to that signature, we know that the Bellerophon was modeled by Bertoldo, but it was cast by a different artist, Adriano Fiorentino, who also made a few small bronzes himself, like this massive satire, again in Vienna. Well, what can I say? We have a great collection. <laughs> when you look at 
around the, probably the date of the execution of this piece, 1485 or 1495, you will notice that it is more or less contemporary to Antiquus first bronzes. But I think I do not need to say much. You can see the difference for yourselves. And you can see why the Mantuan sculptor was called Antico. His bronzes are not only a revival, they are a true recreation of the small bronze of antiquity in every sense. The genre, in all its beauty and refinement, was truly reborn in Antico's work. After this short presentation of what was done before Antico, you can see perhaps that only with Antico, the small bronze statuette became what it really was and is all about, a highly desirable object for collectors. Antico was really the first sculptor to grasp the potential of the genre and he made it work. Let me point out just one detail that is perhaps not so obvious, the base or plinth of Antico statuette. I mean this piece here. The base of uh, Antico's statuette, when you compare it to Adriano's, uh, Adriano's satire on the right side, uh, who is standing on a rather unattractive piece of square metal, is rather remarkable. It is a round base with a beautiful profile, a shape that was inspired, of course, by antique small bronzes. I show you here a Roman Hercules from the first to second centuries AD with its original plinth, which derives its characteristic form from the bases of Attic columns, such as those from the Ionic columns of the Arictaeon in Athens. It is rather strange that this ideally suited type of plinth was not adopted by any other Renaissance artists besides Antico. Only he is using this shape regularly always adopting the size and type of profile perfectly to the statuette. The Little David by Bellano, which I showed you earlier, is the only comparable other example for this type of plinth. But as you can see, this little drum-shaped base does not have the elegance of Antico's creation. How essential Antico's plinths are for his statuettes becomes apparent when they are missing. I show you here the figure of Atropos in Vienna, on the left and on the right, the earlier cast in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which does not have the original plinth. It stands on a nicely made modern circle, but of course, it is not the same thing, which is why you won't find it in the exhibition. It has been removed for this display for the very first time, and the, um, the effect is, in, is amazing. It may appear exaggerated that I attach such importance to Antico's plinth, but they do demonstrate how acutely aware, aware he was of the true purpose of small bronzes. They should look good on the shelf in the studio of the humanist collector, as well as when taken down for close inspection. Indeed, Antico statuettes look best when placed rather high so that they are viewed from below. The Hercules, for instance, who looks a bit stocky when viewed uh, at eye level, improves greatly when seen from below. I can only invite you to try this out. When you are in the exhibition, try to hunker down in front of the vitrine and you will see the difference that makes. And this is a significant observation. We know from the Grotta of Isabella d'Este, this was the room where she kept her bronzes, that the bronzes were placed on the shelf above the wood paneling, here. Which is, as you can judge from the door, approximately at the height of your head. One can see this also in the painting by Carpaccio, where the collection of Saint Jerome is displayed on this shelf. You can even make out two bronze statuettes on this shelf, a horse and a female nude, and this one. 
So this is where you kept your bronzes in the 15th and in the 16th century. And then you would take them down, place them on your table and play with them. And that is exactly what Antiquus bronzes are made for, for handling, for being seen from up close. But they should look also good when sitting on the shelf. And here comes the beauty of Antiquus round blinds. When you put a statuette by Antico back on the shelf, it does not matter how you place it there. A little bit more turned to the left or a little bit more turned to the right does not matter. With the round blind, it will always look good. The round blind was, I think, an important factor to make Antico realize another potential of small bronzes, something you cannot do with large sculpture, for they are too heavy. You can turn it around and appreciate different views. Some of Antico's creations are indeed early examples of an invention that would be the thrill of the second half of the 16th century, the so-called figura serpentinata. For once, a technical term does actually express what it's supposed to mean. So, what is the purpose of a figura serpentinata? Well, it looks good and interesting from more than one side. Ideally, it is equally exciting from all sides. In this sense, Antiquus Atropos, an invention of circa 1500, is extraordinarily sophisticated. It is simply an enormous pleasure to hold her in your hand and to turn her around. It is an experience comparable to the delight of handling a statuette by Giambologna, the great and perhaps unsurpassed master of the genre. I show you here Antiquus Atropos next to the Cesarini Venus by Giambologna, made some 80 years later. Even in the photo, you can notice how the curve of the bottom of both statuettes is made to fit into your open palm. Indeed, I would argue that Giambologna's exquisite small bronzes are the direct successor of Antico's creations. Both artists worked for the sophisticated taste of noble courts. And I very much wonder if Antico's example was not more important for Giambologna than we think. In Antico's oeuvre, Giambologna could have seen the attraction of a small, expertly cast bronze and that one can satisfy more than one client with the fruit of one's labor. The other great Renaissance master of bronze was the pattern artist Andrea Riccio, who is far better known and far more valued than Antico, which is probably okay since he is the more exciting artist, but he started his production of small bronzes only after the turn of the century. He began to work on the Paschal candlestick in 1507, and his independent small bronzes were, he, were not made before the second decade of the 16th century. So it is actually Antico who has to, who has to be called the first great master of the small bronze. Maybe a small point, but an important one, particularly in the great, greater picture of the development of the genre. But let us turn to our Atropos. For this figure, it was not possible so far to identify its antique model. Her head, and this has not been recognized so far, must have been inspired by the famous Aphrodite of Cnidus by the Greek sculptor Praxiteles, and I'm sharing you, with you this um, new information. But the pose of her body seems to have been Antico's own invention inspired, to be sure, by different antique models, but combined to an entirely new composition. And this is not the only remarkable trait of Antico's little Atropos. What is actually exciting about her is that she is nude. I mean, exciting in an artistic sense, of course. <laughs> um, she's not exciting nude, you know, but you know what I mean. Um, anyway, it is remarkable that Antico depicts here a totally naked woman, because the female nude was only very reluctantly explored in the 15th century, be it in painting or in sculpture. 
The subject could not be avoided when it came to depictions of Eve. But, as is required also by the theme, she's always a figure that is visibly uncomfortable with her unclothed state. And she's hardly ever beautiful. Female nudes which display their uncovered, ideal bodies in an assured and confident manner, such as Antico's figures do, cannot be found before 1500. Antico is thus, and this may come as a surprise, for he is not exactly considered an erotic artist, is a pioneer in the depiction of the female nude. Just look at this kneeling nude from the Thyssen collection, which is unfortunately not in the exhibition, but I think that's the only lacuna. So I have to refer here again to Giambologna, because the unperturbed and natural rendering of the female no nude will not be encountered again in sculpture until his depictions of bathing beauties some 80 years later. It is very telling that scholars did at first not recognize what the subject matter of Antiquus Atropos actually was. Because of her nudity, she was considered to be what all pretty female nudes are considered to be, namely a depiction of Venus, the goddess of love. It took a while until it was recognized that she's supposed to hold a thread in her hands, which she is about to cut through with scissors, which she holds in her right hand. In the London version of the statuette, present in the exhibition, one can see the remains of the scissors. So she is not Venus, which would be a perfect excuse to depict her naked, but one of the three Morai, the antique goddesses of fate and destiny. One spins the thread of life, one measures its length, and Atropos ends the life of each mortal by cutting the thread. According to Greek mythology, the three fates are supposed to be old, ugly, and of course fully clothed. So in terms of subject matter, there was absolutely no necessity to, to, to depict them nude. So this was apparently Antico's decision. That he was interested as an artist in ideal female nudity can be seen over and over again in his oeuvre. Like for instance, in his version of the Venus Felix. You see the antique original on the left. Antico was changing not only the severe head of his model, but he makes her hold the drapery also at a much lower place, where it covers nothing of importance anymore. Well, I hope to have covered tonight what seemed important to me. Antico's pioneering role in establishing the bronze statuette as a new Renaissance genre. His innovative exploration of the classical bust would be the subject for another evening. And I'm very sorry that I cannot cover that tonight too. I hope you will enjoy to discover a truly exciting artist in the beautiful show downstairs, which is open for your enjoyment until July 29th. And you can also watch it now for another half an hour. At this moment, I just want to thank, thank you to you for your kind attention. <laughs>